Welcome to everybody. Thanks for joining. Um, we'll everybody hopefully got an email with the agenda. And so what we'll do first is we'll go ahead um, and approve the agenda. We changed the running, well, I have a suggestion to change the running order a little bit from the email that I sent out. In that first up, um, we'll have um, Cody Pedersen, Dr. Cody Pedersen, who'll talk to us about the redistricting. Um, and then we'll have Brandon McDonald uh, from the Western Service Workers Association talk about their holiday campaign, uh, both for Thanksgiving and for, uh, for the winter holiday. Um, and then after that, we'll have our featured speaker, who is uh, Timothy Holmberg, who will talk on the alternative community housing models. And so with that, can I get a motion to approve the agenda? I move we approve the agenda. That's great. And that, can I have, get a second? Yeah, yeah I second. Like second. Excellent. That's good. And then uh, any further discussion? Okay. Um, and any objections? Yeah. Hearing, hearing no objections, we'll assume that it's passed unanimously. And then, yeah, we could do the minutes at the moment. We'll do those later, probably, Kip. If you're okay for time, Kip, to do the. Uh, no, that's fine. Yeah, perfect. Excellent. In which case, we will go straight on into um, Cody's presentation. And Cody, I, I don't know if you have any slides. I can make you a uh, co-host if you do, if you want to show anything. Yeah, why don't you uh, make me a co-host? I, I can go through. I mean, this is a, um, uh, it's not the, the uh, full runway. I, I typically, uh, but uh, this is a very quickly evolving situation. So I've put together a few slides to talk us through. Um, and there's basically uh, five different levels. There's um, Congress, State Senate, Assembly, uh, County, and then City of San Diego. We could talk about other things, but I think we'll stick with those if, that's, uh, a, if everyone feels good about that, given that those are the ones that affect this club the most. Yeah, um, I think that's great. Yeah, okay. and we'll give you more time, Cody, last time, because we, we squeezed you in last time. But okay. said, it was really good and interesting. So, you, you, yeah, feel free. Okay. So great, great. So, so what I'll just, so I'll share some maps at the appropriate time. Let me just say a broad refresher. Uh, this is the, um, this is the redistricting, um, the every, what is it, decennial? Is that the proper term for it? And, um, and so last time I we went over the various criteria for um, the kinds of changes that need to be made and what needs to take, take into account, communities of interest, um, not, not diluting communities of interest, um, uh, well, not, not diluting protected categories, um, not diluting their power, not breaking up communities of interest, uh, not breaking up cities, towns, or census designated places. Um, and trying to make boundaries that are intelligible to people so that people can make some sense of the world in which they find themselves um, and, and their districts. Um, and so uh, this has been a very kind of an insane process. Some of it is a little bit inaccessible to locals, like the, um, the state step congressional and um, assembly and state senate are a little bit difficult for us to to get involved with but we we've seen a lot of participation in the county and city of san diego processes they've been very contentious particularly the city of san diego um and uh, i'll go over like some of that 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 conflict i'll start with the city of san diego probably because it's the one that's in that's like foremost in people's mind um i will share uh let's see i'll open these um uh let's see i have a series of maps hopefully they'll all open in the right right application here. I can't guarantee that. I think they'll open in preview and that way I can just pull them up on preview. So um, the first thing I'm going to do is share, I will share this, um, my preview screen here. Uh, yeah. Can folks see that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. That's good. So we just um, last or a week, a week and a half ago now, they uh, adopted a preliminary map. City of San Diego has a criteria which says a preliminary map has to have at least five hearings on it. So they are under very serious time constraint and they really had to produce a preliminary map. Frequently when it comes down to the wire, they just like choose a map and go with it and then they'll make some, some, some edits. But, but really it was remarkable. There was a lot of conflict over this map. I can't represent the details of the conflicts that are emerging in the Southeast because I'm not as familiar with those neighborhoods. I am very familiar with the process that occurred in, um, I would say the sort of Northwest uh 
northwest quadrant here that includes uh, D, D2, D1, D2, um, D6, and uh, what is that, D5? Um, and so to make sense of this map, it's a little difficult. I'm actually, you know what? I'm going to stop this share and I'm going to share my actual, the actual application. Let me make sure it's on the right page here so that I can actually show something to you in this editing process. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll share um, uh, the actual Districtor software. Let me, I think this will work. All right, now do you see this? Yes. So this is the actual Districtor um, application. Now the city of San Diego has an excellent application, especially in comparison to the counties, which is really kludgy and, and, and very challenging to use. This thing is very fast. You can make maps very quickly. So this is the preliminary map. It will not change very much. Now I'm gonna select um, this right here, current city council. And I select that so that we can actually talk about it. It's a little hard to make sense of what's happening on the map unless you see where the old lines were and where the lines of conflict were. So um, let me see this. I also, let me go over this real quick. I think there's a, oh no, not that, sorry. Um, I am going to, uh, I think it's here. I, I wanted to also, there's so many of these um, maps that I'm going through. I'm going to try to, I'm trying to kind of govern the experience here a little bit. Um, so if you look here on this map, you see D5 up here. It looks broadly, it looks pretty similar actually. So D5 hasn't been that heavily impacted, but you see, to see what's happened on this map, a lot of what happened in this map was determined by conflict over D6. Um, now, given that D6 is the one fleet swing district, you can imagine this is similar to the county, and I'll talk about it. A lot of count conflicts of the county happened in D5, which is Desmond's seat, and it's really the only one which could potentially flip, um, depending on the map. So there's, there's a certain logic to like the real conflict emerging over districts that are about to flip or could flip. And given that this, this D6 was the last bastion of the Republican Party, and they are almost certainly done for the time being in San Diego um, at the city level, um, there's, there's been a lot of conflict over this. Now, so we'll look real closely at what the transformations are that occurred in D6. D, D2 was very organized. A lot of people were, were, were organized and thinking about D2. There was a whole coalition that was thinking about D1, which was kind of UC and La Jolla were working together as well as some people from Carmel Valley. But very early on in the process, there was a conflict that emerged. Given where we are, just in terms of equity and, and in terms of our um, current public discourse, um, especially coming out of COVID, the API community has really, with, with good reason, been very motivated to demand uh, adequate representation. It's a little complex because this district, under no circumstance, would, would really almost any city council district have a majority, which is where you really start tripping up on the, the um, dilution questions. But D6 could have been like low 30s to low 40s in terms of API population. So it was a question in terms of, 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 of concentrating the API community. And if you guys will remember, there was a conflict, um, you probably saw it in the Union Tribune uh, with Mitz Lee, she was a commissioner. Um, and Mitz Lee, um, it was a lot has a long time activist on these issues, API issues, and particularly districting issues. And she had formed a group called APAC. Um, and it was its goal was really some of its goal was this re, this this districting to have an API district six. Um, you'll, you'll, if you remember in that UT article, she had her, I guess it was her vice chair in that organization, Sarah Kamiab. Um, really broke with her. And um, there was a whole series of news articles about she had to step down from the commission. And it really involved a conflict between two, two, two visions of an API district, one of which um, moved into the uni university area and another of which moved, would have had the district take in, keep Rancho Penasquitos and take North, unify Rancho Penasquitos and also probably pick up Scripps Ranch and that would have been a, maybe a 41% API. What ended up winning out mostly was a differing vision, which had District 6 moving pretty hard. If you'll remember, there was a map that came out several weeks ago, which had the district moving all the way into the coast, taking Biotech Beach, taking North La Jolla. Part of what happened here in my interpretation, and I think a lot of people's interpretation is sort of Biocom, Chancellor's Office became very focused on this map. 
Um, and we can talk someday about an emerging theory that this, that the, not, a, not my theory, it's a theory that the University of California has about the way in which its charter affects land use. And so there's really been a, a lot of conflict in La, particularly in La Jolla Heights up here around a vision of land use, which is in conflict with like La Jolla's, I guess a little more NIMBY, but a little more sort of environmental concerns and coastal concerns. So anyway, was a, that was a conflict and there was a huge battle over the future of D6. And you can see what ended up happening is they gave up South PQ, which is very strange in terms of Asian empowerment because that is a long time core Asian American community. And to concede that's a little bit strange. And they, in return, they took, they took parts of Sereno Valley, which is again, that's UCSD's sort of sphere in terms of development and uh, biotech building and, and real estate investment trust. They really want that, that structure there. And they like being D6 more than D1 because D1 is traditionally more constraining on development, whereas D6 is traditionally more um, permissive. And they took University City. It's a little bit counterintuitive from an API perspective because these are not um, sort of high propensity long-time residents. These are usually students Students in North, it, it is very API, but it's typically not your sort of high, you won't get a lot of, I mean, compared to Ranch of Pantosquitos and Scripps Ranch, it's not gonna give them an electoral bump for the API community, but that's their call. That's the map that won out. Um, and you'll see what it did that's very surprising. It took La Jolla and Carmel Valley, it held Carmel Valley and La Jolla together with, with um, Biotech Beach there holding together a Tory, Tory, whatever that is, whatever they're calling it now, um, the Tory Pines area. And it, but it took, no, it took Pacific Beach, which is very surprising. And part of that is because this push the D6 made into the University City area. So boom, they had to take it from somewhere, Sereno Valley and, 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 um, uh, and you know, University City. And they, they basically pushed, they pushed it in the middle, squeezed it down south in the, to Pacific Beach. Now, what that did to your district, this is relevant to you, you could, because you had to make up that here, it basically pushed D2 into Claremont um, and, and Bayho. And uh, so that's what you have now. You have a map of D2, which gets shoved to the side in the north. Um, and we could probably have a conversation about what that means. Uh, you know, I think a lot of folks in UC were not very happy about this, um, but at, I think a lot of the people in Carmel Valley and, and La Jolla are, are happy, at least that the coast was held together. It was not as, as like problematic as some of the iterations were. Um, I'd love to hear about how folks here in Point Loma feel about this map, but let me move on here because I'm going to be short on time. So um, that I'm going to pull away from that. I'm going to stop the share on that and I'm going to go back to sharing um, my map on the, that's just preview here. Let's see here. So uh, again, that's the current map. Uh, we can talk a little bit about that. We can probably take some, um, some questions at some point and communicate about that. But I'm gonna move very quickly over to the county, move up a, move up a jurisdiction. Let me be clear about the county. It is, to my mind, behind the eight ball. It's got two weeks to close this deal out and it is not, it, it, they did a, uh, like a flash meeting on fairly short notice, right at the limit for Friday night. It went from 5 p.m. until 1.30 a.m. at night on a Friday night. Um, and it did not create the kind of consolidation around one map that presumably they wanted to get out of that. There's another meeting on December 2nd. Um, this is a map, this is a districting process that's still very much in the air. The city's process, they have their preliminary map. It's just going to change in small ways. So if you want to take a look at that on Districter and you think some small change would be desirable, I encourage you to do, do that. Um, it's not going to change much. So this map, if you want to participate in this process, it will still change dramatically because in the last meeting, that one that went to 1, 1 a.m., they stuck with 13A and 13B and uh, or sorry, 13A and uh, 14, um, and with each one having three variations, a lot of motions from the dais. Um, it is not; it's still in air, in the air. But let me say what common to these two maps, and their numbering is a little off depending on how they distribute it. But map 13, which frankly is the one that the board, that the commission seems more inclined toward, um, map 13 would they both have a coastal district? 
that is going probably going to be a reality one way or another. There's going to be a coastal district, which is good. It's, I think it's great for us representing our coastal issues, um, sea level rise, climate change, issues around housing, um, issues around whatever, short-term vacation rentals, land use, um, coastal protection. So there's a lot of things that these communities have in common. And I do think that they share a community of interest. Certainly, I think a lot of you would agree, like, this is kind of our world, you know? So it, it kind of makes sense. Um, so this, the two maps differ somewhat along the coast in, in the district in which you would have be. Both, and for, for your purposes, there has not been a single testimony that I've heard that says, Point Loma should remain in District 1. And if you see this map, it has the old map, old districts in blue. When, whatever happens, it's very unlikely that Point Loma will go into District 1. It, Coronado may at the last second get pushed into D1 because the commission's a little bit uncomfortable about using either the bridge or the ferry to connect, and you need some connection for mapping. The, 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 the council has said they can use either of those. This is enough contiguity for to be adequate, but the commission seems a little uncomfortable about not using the isthmus. And if you used either the bridge, if you use the bridge, you would need to, for the coast, you would need to come down to Logan, Logan, or to, to Barrio Logan. And if you use the isthmus, you'd have to come all the way down here. So it depends. This may, Coronado may get put back in D1, but I doubt it. Point Loma is for sure in the coastal district. No map I've seen for the last two months has had Point Loma not be in a coastal district, which I think is Good. I mean, it aligns with where we formerly were. Um, let me see here. Uh, so, um, and then the other map, uh, that's, so that was, so this is 13A. It goes from Carlsbad to Coronado. 14 goes from Encinitas to Coronado. They differ a little about what happens on the interior, whether it includes the AAPI community or not. Um, then you have a center city district in, in kind of in both these maps have a city center district you see here in purple or in green that's similar it stretches from uptown to El Cajon. Some of this El Cajon and Rancho San Diego will probably get put in the, the, the east district. We can talk at another point about the differences between these two maps, but let me just say this is still up in the air. If you want to participate in one of these maps, I would do so because it's still very much in the air. Let me shift over in the time remaining <coughs> to the assembly. Um, let me, here we go. So I think this is kind of a pretty attractive, again, the idea of a coastal district is definitely catching up. I mean, it's definitely a, a pr um, pronounced in this cycle. In this assembly map, you have your, and again, these don't have numbers yet. And the numbering is like the last thing that gets done, but the, the map that used to be basically the 76, this pushes, the 76th district, it takes it then from Carlsbad all the way down to Coronado. It is a true coastal district. I mean, there's not, there's hardly a, 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 a spot on this thing that is not in view of the ocean. I mean, this is like a hardcore coastal district. Um, and then you'll see the other districts are kind of, um, this would probably be the 80th, this would probably be the 79th. Um, uh, and then uh, downtown would still be in the 78th. So, you know, uh, probably Chris Ward would, you know, go with his residence here in the 78th. <clears throat> That's my guess, something like that. And then this would be, again, that, and then this would be the 76, this would be the 77. Anyhow, we could potentially, I don't know, whatever the case, this East County district looks very unfavorable to the Democrats, as you can imagine. Um, but, um, but yeah, so let me switch over to um, the state Senate and then Congress, and then I'll, I'll hand it over. I, I, uh, I apologize if I'm taking too long. Um, so here's San Diego full. This is a little hard to see because it has these orange lines, which are not very good for human eyes. Um, but um, can you see these orange lines from the map? Yeah, just about. Yeah, just yeah. about. Yeah, unfortunately. Now, this is interesting. So here's the state Senate district, the district in which, for instance, um, Pat Bates is in and which um, um, Catherine Blakespear is running in this map would go all the way down and pick up La Jolla. Um, yeah, it would go all the way down to pick up La Jolla and, um, and then that would then make, now here's the weird part. This would then take basically the 39th, maybe, I don't know what the numbering would be, but basically the center, um, Pacific beach and mission beach. And then like your, your core here, Kearney Mesa, um, uh, Mira Mesa 
would then be in a district with Santee, Poway, Valley Center, Escondido. It would just go up the interior. It's kind of a strange district. I don't, uh, now's not the time for me to try to wrap my head around that, but it would be interesting. And, and Point Loma would be in this district, which itself is a little bit interesting, which goes from Point Loma and Cordado all the way out through Lemon Grove and into El Cajon and then goes on a little journey here. Uh, I don't know to where, toward Hamul. Um, so anyhow, that's a little interesting. The Senate district's a little bit, a little bit more disruptive potentially than the um, assembly districts. And then I'll switch over here to, um, let's see, to the Congress. And here's, I'll close out here with Congress. Um, Congress, uh, Mike Levin's district is pretty similar. It, I guess it would go to Solana Beach. And then the problem, uh, it was, it kind of jogged out to Fallbrook. And in a previous iteration, went out to Rainbow. So that's a little complicated. That Fallbrook bulge makes it a little bit more difficult. I think his district, if it were this, it would go down to like, it's on the edge now. I mean, it would make it a tough race for him. But he's an incumbent, so he has some advantages. Um, but anyhow, this is not a great map for, for the 49th or whatever that ends up becoming. Um, this is actually, this is becomes a, a much more progressive 52nd or 51st, whatever ends up becoming. Uh, it's basically Peter's district, but it loses Poway. Um, and so it's it's still very, very, very blue, even bluer, much bluer, probably two or three percentage points bluer than it was before by losing Poway. And then you have a like Vargas's district here. Um, and then these become potentially, these become honestly flippable I, I, they, because they start taking in some stuff um particularly this district starts taking in some a little bit more like bluer it may be that it i think what I, from what i've heard the current maps make the what it is now the 50th a little bit more attractive slight a few a, a percentage point a couple percentage points more attractive for democrats uh i will also point out that this map is not i don't have you can look online, but I don't have a map for like the 53rd currently. We will probably lose a district. So the numbering is going to, we not us, but it'll probably be, you know, it'll pull out of LA, but I, with the numbering is going to be messed up for us. I think what's now the 53rd will be very different. This will be a very different district. Um, so I don't know. There could be conflict around that. Anyhow. That's my overview. Um, if somebody would like to ask a question at any time or some for some clarification, um, I don't know our time thing, but I'm happy to uh, step off stage left or to answer any questions. Yeah, I think with just one question, or just to clarify, Cody, in the chat, uh, Mary McKenzie asked if you could repeat what you said about Chris Ward and his assembly district. Oh yeah, I think what's likely, and I haven't talked to, um, I haven't talked to, uh, I, I talked to. I, I talked to Tasha and she's fine with whatever. And, um, but I haven't talked to, uh, uh, um, uh, assembly member Ward yet, but, I, but presumably he would be, it would predominantly be like a, a, a very, um, it, his district would still be centered around, um, the coast would basically go probably. And again, I mean, this stuff gets hammered out, but my guess is that the coast, like Tasha would run on in that coastal district. Um, and then um, the sum and reward would still basically run on a downtown, uptown, um, you know, um, uh, Kensington, Hillcrest sort of thing. I don't, I, I think he'd be happy with his map too, but I, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but that's pres presumably. Right. What would happen. Thank you. Oh. Cool. And any other questions people have just quickly? And, and if not, Cody, you're hanging around till the end, right? So people sure. can hang on afterwards if there are more detailed questions. Yeah. No, but thank you, Cody, so much for that. It was good. Um, yeah. And as you said, on the county maps, then that's the one if people have, want to weigh in on that, is to join the, the meeting December 2nd, I think you said. And you yeah. can leave comments as well online, right? If you don't want to sit through the meeting, you can post comments on the website. Yes, absolutely. No, that's great. Thank you so much. Always that's happy great. to serve. Love this club. That's good. Excellent. So, Brandon, if you're, if you're there, you're up next. And if you want to give us a little bit of background on what you're going to be up to uh, for the holiday. Happy to. Thank you very much. Can everybody hear me okay? Yep, you sound yes, good. Okay. 
Thank you. So my name is Brandon McDonald. Um, I'm the operations manager with Western Service Workers Association. And thank you, John, for uh, sending out that email to everybody about our upcoming holiday events. Um, as you said, I want to start off explaining a little bit about um, uh, Western Service Workers Association, even though I noticed like almost I recognize almost every name that I saw on the on the browser here, but Western Service Workers Association is a membership association of some of the lowest paid workers in San Diego County. And um, our members, you know, obviously got slammed by the pandemic. And so um, our members were the first to lose their jobs, were the most exposed to the pandemic, were the, the last to be vaccinated, and the least able to be able to afford to shelter in place. And so this past you know, 20 months has been very challenging for us, um, no, obviously. And so we, we really stepped up tremendously. We um, were doing food distributions where we, you know, are distributing two tons of food every week. Um, for a while, we were doing, doing, distributing about a ton of food every day and because it was so scarce. And we were just about the only people deliver, distributing food for a short time. And in addition to that, our members couldn't shelter in place. So before the vaccine, vaccines were readily available, um, we are, uh, have a unique reach on the one hand into some of the lowest income neighborhoods um, because we do community canvassing every week for the past 40 years. And in addition, we have a constituency of volunteers, many of which from the Point Loma Democratic Club. So we just had our members calling other members. And when we found somebody who is COVID positive, we said, look, stay at home. Don't go anywhere. Stay. And our members can't afford it. So we had somebody call them every single day. Rapid response teams would rush out shampoo, you know, um, oranges, whatever kind of food, whatever kind of household supplies that they needed so people could stay in place and not go anywhere. Um, some of our members, we had an 80-year-old member and they would, wouldn't give her a phone appointment at the local clinic, even though she was suffering from terrible um, symptoms of COVID, not respiratory, thank God, but terrible symptoms. And she couldn't get a phone appointment for two weeks. So we got her on the phone with one of our volunteer doctors within two hours. So this is the kind of thing that we've been doing um, during the pandemic and now dealing with a tremendous amount of pandemic debt. You know, as of last January, it was a billion dollars, I think $69,000 or something like that of, of water debt in San, in, in San Diego. And, um, and for electricity, it's, it's on par. And for, uh, we used to have people coming into our office with electric bills or water bills that were two or $300 in arrears. And now it's something in the realm of two or $3,000. And it's that that people just can't crawl out of. So um, all this is to say, this is the kind of organization where it's really pulling on an all volunteer effort, pulling people from all walks of life. And then at the same time, you know, finding community solutions to these problems while doing our best to turn around the root causes of poverty. And one of the things that our members did do was we did a mobilization in September to try and stop the, uh, the city's water rate hike. Because of course they raised the water rates during the middle of a pandemic, a global pandemic. And so our members had something to say about that and where the city could get their money um, in order to fund this. But unfortunately, we were um, we we lost. The, the city voted unanimously in order to raise the rates. So all of this is to say that the holiday campaign that we're doing is of the utmost importance this year, and it's so needed. And we really appreciate all the help that Point Loma Democratic Club has given us over the years for our back to school collections and our toy dog collections. Um, we in two days we have a turkey basket distribution, which is lots of fun. It's going to be. Um, at St. Rita's Church, you can call our office to find out more information, but it's a lot of fun. It's all outdoors. Um, uh, well, the second half is all outdoors and um, we get literally tons of food and we deliver it to people's houses. You kind of feel like Santa Claus. And we have another one on the 22nd of December and we do urgently need volunteers for this. In addition to this, we do have a toy distribution that we're doing for children and we need those toys by the 17th. And um, we do have a registry. So you can do one of two things. John has put um, uh, sent out an email which has a link to a registry where you can just go and you can get it. Um, we prefer that what you might be able to do is um, you can like order from the registry and then go pick it up, like actually have your car, you can have somebody bring it out to your car and then bring it to our office. We're open every single day until 9 p.m., seven days a week. That way you don't have to worry about supply chain problems because we need the toys by the 17th so that we can do a, a toy sort. 
um, so that we can distribute those toys with the, um, the holiday baskets on the, the 22nd of December. So those are the things that are coming up. And we just, I just wanted to make it very clear that um, on the one hand, that this is very much needed and any help that you can give would make a tremendous difference. Um, volunteer time is the most important, toys, any kind of other support, um, you can find our information. If you can't find John's email, uh, email that he sent out, you can go on tar the target registry page, search for an organization, not an indiv individual, and just put WSWA and like poof, it pops right up. So, um, so anyways, thank you very much, Point Loma Democratic Club, for all of the support you guys have given us. So thanks, John. Yeah, no, thank you, Brandon. And, and again, we'll put out uh, the links again in the in the email that Kip, in fact, puts out after this meeting today to follow up on that. So yeah, people can click online or call. And uh, I haven't done it recently, but I know in the past that Susan and I have helped with the turkey distribution. And it is a lot of fun just delivering goods to people uh, who are very grateful and, uh, you know, delighted to see what they're receiving in those uh, in gift packages. It, it's excellent. Yeah, so thank you again, Brandon. And then next up, we have um, our feature speaker for today, um, which is uh, Tim Holmberg. Um, and Tim is a former staff reporter for the Gay and Lesbian Times, Uptown News Magazine, and the SDLGBT Weekly. Uh, his focus is on local, political, and social justice issues. Uh, he currently writes freelance for Words and Deeds, um, and also the Times of San Diego, among others. He's currently working on a housing feature article looking at how San Diego can incorporate not-for-profit housing as a tool to address the housing crisis in San Diego. And so, and I should also, I don't know, Tim, if you want to introduce, you have a little friend there with you on the boat, right? <laughs> so, I imagine at some point he'll probably introduce himself. Very good, yeah. Uh, it's a it's a 10-year-old Chihuahua who's got a lot of character. <laughs> so, and a big bark, yeah. anyway. Excellent. Um, thank you very much, John, and thank you for the opportunity to um, talk about an issue that is, um, you know, very real for all of us and very personal, I think, for me. Um, one of the reasons that this is such a personal issue for me is that um, I have been in my life uh, homeless twice, uh, once as a child with my father when we lived in Orange County and then also once here in San Diego. Um, there are a lot of unique characteristics to uh, a lot of urban centers right now that, that they share that have led to a housing crisis uh, that we've all been able to witness. Um, so I have decided to try to take a more active role and to bring the experience that I have on this subject uh, to bear and also to bring some of the stories of different individuals who have been affected by this and to look at different ways that we can try to address this. As we all know, there's a lot of legislation that's currently pending. Um, some of it uh, has some very important uh, ramifications. Some of it I call uh, zombie legislation, which has been um, sort of hijacked by different uh, industries to uh, to try to open the floodgates to development. And of course, we all need development, but it's not just a question of development. We've had lots of development, but we've had very little of that development occur um, in the in the kind of price point that we need uh, and with the kind of affordability that we need. Uh, and this has been an endemic problem uh, that various politicians have tried to address. And unfortunately, um, it, it has defied resolution uh, up to this point. I do want to give a little bit of background uh, about myself. I started as a reporter with the Gay and Lesbian Times Uptown News Magazine under uh, Michael Portentino, who passed away. Um, he gave me my first opportunity as a writer. And um, it was a unique opportunity for me because I was uh, um, you know, writing for as, as a, with an openly gay publication, of course, um, but I was also serving in the military um, on active duty at the time. And so uh, it was a, it was a unique time period for me. Um, 
I served 17 years in the Marine Corps. I had an opportunity, of course, to experience uh, public housing through the military. <laughs> um, I was a jet mechanic uh, with the Marine Corps. And then um, I, you know, in the course of doing my, my work as a reporter, I, I really found that to be my passion. And I did that uh, starting in 1996 all the way to today. Um, I mentioned that, uh, you know, I was homeless twice. I do want to expand a little bit on, on that. My father and I uh, found ourselves, uh, you know, he, he made mistakes. And for some homeless people, that is the reason they, they wind up on the streets. Um, they fall off the sort of economic cart because, you know, of some misjudgments in my case, in my father's case, he tried to start a business. He put a lot of his assets and resources into that. And when it didn't work out, um, you know, he wasn't, uh, wasn't able to immediately uh, get back into the employment field. And, um, you know, we wound up in our car. Um, and it was a very educational experience for somebody who was 16 years of age. It was a crucial time for me. I wound up having to drop out of high school. Um, and Irvine, which bills itself as a master plan community, obviously never planned for homelessness within their community, which is certainly unfortunate for us. Uh, the extent of their planning for homelessness um, was pretty much the police force, which is quite familiar to a lot of municipalities these days. Um, and hopefully that will change in the near future. Um, when, it, when we talk about low-income housing, of course, uh, if you're not able to access low-income housing or affordable housing, um, it puts you on the margins of being extraordinarily vulnerable to homelessness. Um, and in fact, that really is a big part of the story of why our homeless crisis in San Diego has exploded and, and a big part of the story uh, in other municipalities as well. Um, I wanna kind of touch on a couple of examples of individuals that I know in the community, obviously without naming them. Uh, one of them is an artist friend of mine that I've worked with in the past. Um, you know, he's a trailblazing artist. He's been a part of the San Diego community for a long time, um, but he has found it increasingly difficult to exist and subsist really as an artist within San Diego. Um, and, and has recently begun to look for other places to, to go. Um, he's been a part of the community since I joined, in fact, probably even before I joined San Diego, uh, after escaping from what I call behind the orange curtain. Um, he uh, moved from Atlanta because he is an openly gay man. Um, he became a successful artist here in San Diego. And the majority of his productive career as an artist has been here in San Diego. Um, but because of housing costs uh, and the inability to access affordable housing, uh, it is quite likely that he will leave our community and that will be an unfortunate loss. Um, another individual I know uh, had a job here in San Diego as a baker, uh, which I think is a wonderful profession. Um, I was very surprised uh, to learn that uh, at the time he was making over minimum wage. Um, uh, this would have been about maybe four and a half years ago, um, but was not able to keep up with the cost of living here in San Diego. He worked full time. And in fact, he even worked overtime. Uh, but even then uh, he, really couldn't make it. So he and his partner moved to Indiana. Uh, he is also openly gay. And I'd like to mention something too. I've, I've heard in a number of discussions and, and some of the articles that I've written, um, you know, there, there's been a viewpoint which probably isn't shared very much in this group, but, but has been percolating amongst other more conservative groups of, well, if you can't afford to live here, then why don't you just go ahead and move somewhere else? Um, you know, if you're an openly gay man or lesbian woman or trans person, that's a very complicated decision. In many cases, 
individuals from this community have actually moved to urban areas in order to escape the kind of discrimination and potential violence uh, that our mere identity and existence uh, embodies. Um, and so, you know, I think it's very important for us to tap into our sense of empathy to understand that this isn't necessarily, not only is it not a reasonable choice, it's, um, it's not one that doesn't honor our sense of empathy and it actually doesn't do our community any good. Um, another individual I know uh, is disabled. Uh, he relies on Section 8 housing. Um, Section 8 housing is extraordinarily difficult to access in San Diego. Um, many landlords will outright decline Section 8 vouchers um, and others will covertly avoid having to uh, decline a Section 8 voucher by stating that they have income requirements that a person on disability could simply not afford uh, because they don't present the appropriate level of income. Um, we have uh, right now a statistic, um, and I don't have the exact statistic in front of me, but I know a substantial portion of our community is currently living, uh, spending over 50% of their income on housing. That has a lot of implications. Uh, it has a lot of implications in terms of the success of relationships, mental health. Um, a lot of the different um, issues that we deal with um, in San Diego find their nexus at the, at the effects of people who are living and struggling so much in order to maintain shelter for themselves um, that eventually even a small hiccup or mistake uh, can put them on the streets. Um, you know, it, and that actually is, is quite relevant to my second bout of homelessness here in San Diego. Um, we have consistently looked to the for-profit uh, housing industry to try to remedy uh, this issue. And after years of um, extraordinary political influence that's been able to be wielded by uh, the developers in San Diego and elsewhere, we have very little to show for it. Um, the fact of the matter is that for a variety of reasons, the for-profit housing industry is simply not geared to provide the kind of housing resources that we need at affordable costs. Uh, one issue is that even if you are a developer that would like to develop something that is affordable, you find it difficult to access capital. Um, capital seeks the highest return. And of course, affordable housing is predicated on limiting the profit margin or the profit motive uh, so that you can achieve levels of affordability. Another issue, of course, is land. Um, a lot of times the housing industry likes to point out that we only have so much land and it has to go to a certain price because it's a bidding war. Um, the land has value. And so therefore it makes it very difficult, if not impossible to achieve um, affordable housing in San Diego. Um, return on investment, of course, uh, is linked to capital. Um, and, and so it's going to um, limit the ability to ever achieve the kind of affordability that, we, that we're looking for. Every, every developer is looking for the maximum return that they can get. Um, and that's their job. Um, one of the types of housing that we have not looked at, or one of the, the mechanisms for, for achieving affordable housing uh, that we have not looked at is the not-for-profit model. Um, there is a little bit of this going on in San Diego, but it's received very little attention um, and even less support. Uh, hopefully some of that will change. Um, and I'm hoping that through conversations like this, that as the legislation that's pending in Sacramento uh, continues to move through the legislature that 
issues like this can be brought up and that legislators can be made aware of the desire of communities to see alternative mechanisms introduced into our pursuit for not for uh, affordable housing. Um, some of the types of nonprofit housing that exist out there and have existed for many decades um, are communal housing, uh, collectives that can either be urban agriculture uh, or artist collectives. There are many examples of that. Uh, in the World's Fair uh, or World's Exposition, uh, back in 1967, they built uh, an, a demonstration project uh, called Habitat 67 um, that demonstrated not only that you could build affordable housing, but uh, that you could build it to scale and to have it be a value added benefit to the community that it didn't have to be a box that was somewhere. And it, be, it began to incorporate some of the ideas of dignity in affordable housing, which I think is essential. Uh, also co-op housing, and uh, some people will remember uh, back in the day, we used to have a lot of company housing. Uh, it was a very popular um, mode for becoming a homeowner. Um, I think it's important to remember that not-for-profit housing is not a socialist idea. Um, it is, in fact, a uniquely American idea. And there are many examples, including some of the ones that I listed, um, that uh, some of them had their start here in this country, um, and, and some of them are thriving examples um, that do not represent anything to do with socialism. Um, one of the interesting stories that I like to reference is uh, Laguna Beach. I grew up in Orange County, as I mentioned. Uh, Laguna Beach was an arts community. It was an arts colony, in fact. Um, and it became known and renowned for the presence of the art community there, especially in the 60s and 70s. Many people have been to Pageant of the Masters uh, or the Sawdust Festival. Um, as Laguna Beach became more popular and as housing prices and land values began to rise um, in that area, uh, the result was, of course, that most artists had to leave. Um, and so within a span of a couple decades, Laguna Beach went from having a large art community to having next to none. Um, it was at that point that the Laguna Beach City Council decided that it was time for them to step in to preserve this particular aspect of their community's character. And so they decided to use their authority to appropriate some land and to help support an art co uh, artist collective in Laguna Beach to help enhance the art community there and to keep its roots in Laguna Beach. I applaud them for that. This is something that could very easily be done in other communities. And it is on only one example of how you could provide affordable housing that, um, that would have value added benefits to the community and would help alleviate some of the uh, concerns that arise in terms of people being not wanting affordable housing within their um, within their communities. Uh, there's another community in North Carolina called Cello. Um, I sent a link to uh, to John, and hopefully he can share it uh, with everyone. It, that one particularly fascinated me. I happen to have a connection with the daughter of the person who helped establish it. Uh, it has been in existence for 80 years. It follows very closely along the lines of the Quaker tradition. Um, and to me, it is a really fascinating example of what can be achieved in terms of the kinds of affordable communities that can be um, enriching and, uh, and successful in providing affordable housing. Um, I want to come back a little bit to my own personal story. I actually happen to live in a mode of alternative housing. Um, I live on a boat. Um, I chose this particular lifestyle after my military career. Um, I have PTSD. Um, and 
being on the water is a wonderful environment for me to live in, it is peaceful, and it helps considerably with my own mental health. Um, it is a mode of living that for quite some time was illegal, and it is currently um, tolerated, we will say. Um, the Port of San Diego goes to great lengths to try to prevent it being considered an official residence. But there are many people at my marina, like myself, who have chosen to live on their boats. Uh, in part, that's a decision that's based on affordability. Uh, I could not afford uh, to live on my income in San Diego, even though I've been a part of this community for quite some time, uh, were it not for the fact that I lived on my boat. Uh, those who do live on their boat do not have access to any kind of housing protections because we are not considered to be actual tenants, even though we pay a special fee to be able to live on our boats. Um, it's been a considerable problem for many of us uh, when we get into disputes with the marina and um, they have uh, untethered latitude in determining the tenancy of anybody. We have no tenant rights. Um, one of the reasons that's, that issue is important to me is that if we're going to solve our housing crisis, it is going to involve embracing some modes of housing that are non-traditional. And this could include um, uh, vans, van living, which has become very popular. Um, it can include RVs, boats. Um, there's opportunity to uh, formalize those modes of living so that individuals that uh, choose that type of life um, are able to have reasonable rights and reasonable access. Um, and it is a way for people to achieve the kind of housing affordability that currently is not offered in our market. Um, I also want to mention um, one of the drivers that, that, that should be motivating all of us to be asking for some kind of movement towards uh, expanded affordable housing. Um, you know, those who, you know, live in our community, who work in our community, if, you know, if I go down to the street and I get a coffee uh, from Starbucks, I, and granted they're not paying exactly minimum wage, um, but there are a lot of low income individuals that, that we encounter in our daily lives in our communities. We go down to the street and we get a coffee. We go to the grocery store and somebody bags our groceries. We go to a restaurant, somebody buses our tables. Those people should be able to live in our community, in the community that they have a job. And if they don't, and if they can't, um, then what that does is it takes somebody who's uh, earning a low wage who has to finance a commute uh, to be able to go to a part of the city that is more affordable. Uh, and it adds to the traffic burden and the transportation issues that we have in the city. It also has a lot of other social and economic consequences as well. Um, I, I am working on a, uh, a paper that, de that explores affordable housing in different modes that we could possibly embrace. Um, I would like to reach out to different individuals and, and solicit their feedback um, to, to get a sense of how receptive people would be to seeing the kinds of nonprofit um, scenarios that I uh, outlined, you know, things like urban uh, agriculture or art collectives, uh, co-ops in this city. The city, I think, has a tremendous set of resources to bring to bear, so does the state. Um, but the problem is that so much of our politics right now is dominated by profit motives of various special interests. And of course, if you're talking about nonprofit, then it's, this really is going to have to come from the ground up and from communities that say, we want to see a change. We would like to see some kind of pilot projects uh, that embrace some sort of nonprofit uh, housing alternatives. 
Um, so with that, I'd like to turn it back over to John and uh, find out if there's any questions. Yeah, no, thank you, Tim, very much. And so, yeah, if you have questions, if you want to either um, raise your hand, which you can do in the reactions tab, depending on the version of Zoom you have, in the reactions tab down the bottom. Um, you, oh, you, can try, you can try waving at me as well, or you, or you can put a question in the chat if you want to tap in there, if you don't want to speak directly. Um, but first up, we have uh, Greg Robinson. Greg, if you want to go ahead, Greg. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I, I really appreciate uh, your presentation. I used to be head of the Affordable Housing Coalition, uh, and we know that this huge problem we face has to have many, many solutions. And I appreciate your kind of beyond the pale thinking about this because it's so stimulating and so important to hear what you've suggested. Um, I'm curious about what you feel about another connected issue. Um, as a result of recent legal change, actually brought about by the Tony Atkins, our local representative senator here, um, that allows, well, basically does away with R1 zoning for mm. home. That is, mm -hmm. we know in urban areas, like 70% of all urban land is zoned for single family dwellings. And we mm -hmm. need to not only build, we need to increase density, especially. Mm -hmm of our concern for the future and the environment. So I wonder what role you think that a, this kind of increased density in areas that were traditionally zoned for a single family would play in the vision that you're describing. Well, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I have been paying attention to that. Um, you know, this is, this is a you know, it's not a new conflict, but it is definitely one that seems to be coming a little bit to a head um, where you have suburban communities that are increasingly concerned that their way of life is threatened by what could be an onslaught of uh, housing being developed in communities and, and circumventing the entire planning process uh, in order to achieve that. And that's, that's a concern that I share. I, I think one of the things that I see in this particular venture of, of looking at these different types of alternatives is um, my fear is not so much what would happen from a nonprofit uh, collective, uh, an artist collective or an agricultural community collective being cited in Mission Hill somewhere because I think the community actually could find a lot of reasons to support something like that. I think my concern, of course, is that the corporate developers, the, you know, the other developers that have shown a complete lack of regard for the character of communities and for making sure that their development actually adds to the community rather than to overburden the existing infrastructure, that is where my concern lies. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question, um, but that, that's my, that's my stab at it anyway. That's good. Yeah. And no, thank you, Greg. I should have said Dr. Greg Robinson as well. I apologize. But, mm. uh, any other questions people have? Yeah. I see Gary, Gary Wojcik. Yeah. Thanks, John. Uh, hi, Tim. I, um, I think the, uh, the artist collectives are a great idea. And um, I agree with you uh, with the with the idea of like the um, you know the single family uh, zoning because I think what's that's going to be is a gift to the to the developers. I mean, you sure. look at Manhattan, you look at Brooklyn. That all that does is you have a, a developer come in, he'll buy those lots, and you're going to have a lot of small, very expensive housing. It's mm -hmm. an impact on the infrastructure, and yeah. you know I, there should be. There has to be this has to be well thought out before this that happens. The other sure. thing I want to talk about a little bit too is it, and this is kind of the same thing. You mentioned people living in vans and um, you know, um, van culture and all that. Mm -hmm. uh, there's currently a proposal uh, by the city uh, to close parking lots, uh, close them along the beaches, uh, lock the gates in uh, parking lots so people can't park there overnight in mm -hmm. vans and things, okay? So once again, if those individuals are not allowed to park in those places, it's going to push them into the neighborhoods where they don't have facilities or, you know, for, you know, uh, 
you know, to, to you know, sanitary facilities. Uh, I live in the coast area, and this was a big problem during the pandemic. We had people that were parking, and these were not, I mean, these were like, you know, these $200,000 buses, basically, that I, I don't really think homeless people are living in those. I may be wrong, mm. but, you know, we had people using the streets as public restrooms. It was a mess. So they need to mm -hmm. think ahead. Um, if, if they're having individuals that are, are living in these parking lots, there should be a place where they can go to have the services that they need. And just closing those lots and pushing, you know, those individuals onto the streets doesn't give them a, a, an opportunity to get those services. My dog decided to join the conversation Yeah, that's cute. <laughs> <laughs> My lighting is fading here. Um, you know, this actually really touches on me quite personally uh, because, um, you know, my father and I kind of had the experience with that. We lived in our car. Um, we would try to park in the areas that you describe um, or, you know, in some not, you know, nondescript, uh, discreet part of a neighborhood if we couldn't do that. And, and so we did experience being pushed from one place to another. And that really is the problem is that we keep pushing people, you know, who, who frankly don't need to be pushed, they need to be helped. Uh, they need to be provided uh, some actual structured and, and properly resourced, uh, you know, facilities, uh, you know, and, and that is starting to happen. But, you know, of course the city is, you know, still I think in many respects uh, way behind the eight ball on this. I think the other thing I'd like to touch on a little bit is, you know, I think it is time for us to codify some of these alternative modes and to provide uh, the space for their existence so that they don't have to constantly be searching for a place to, to, um, to do this. I mean, the, the, the van living thing I think is, a, is a, a kind of an interesting thing because it's very closely related to the boat issue you know me living on a boat is technically allowed uh well it's it's not technically allowed it's just sort of a quasi thing um you know the the 95 percent of, of human history has been a history of nomadic existence and yes. with the pandemic you know we are seeing people recognize the opportunity um to live differently to live mobily um, and to live in a much smaller footprint environmentally and physically. Um, and so I see this as, as something that could be a positive for all of us, but I think it does require us, you know, really starting to dig in and try to, to create facility for that so that people aren't just, you know, bouncing around and trying to figure out what they can do and what they can't do. And, um, you know, it really is time for us to, to stop, um, <laughs> I don't know what the right term is, but um, to, to um, just stop criminalizing uh, types of living that don't involve living in a, a, a fixed, you know, concrete slab structure, or whatever, four walls with a roof. Um, so I, I think that's uh, a sentiment that I, I definitely would like to put in there. I'm going to turn on my light for a second because I, I look like a giant black blob <laughs> along with my dog. It's okay, that's good. So yeah, any, any other questions? I don't see any on the chat. Oh, let there be light. Good. And there was, and it was good. And the Chihuahua approved. <laughs> it's hard to make a Chihuahua happy sometimes. What do you mean? What do you mean sometimes? <laughs> well, yeah. cheese I treats work. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's true. I have a question for you, Tim, as well. You mentioned the pandemic, you know, different methods of, of uh, for, well, for some segments of the population from working from home. I've been working from home for the last 18 months or something. Mm -hmm. and in the mm -hmm. near future, there's no, you know, software development that I'm engaged in. There's no need to return to the office. In fact, they're planning a whole, you know, method of working where everybody stays remote for a long period of time. And I think mm. when people are working from home, they then go out to their immediate neighborhoods and they find there are lots of things missing. 
you know, they have to get in a car, they have to drive, they have to commute yes. to get basic things, schools, grocery stores, restaurants, bars, theater, music. So do you see, uh, is there a move or a, a need for, in terms of zoning laws, like the UK where I come from, you know, corner stop, you know, shops, stores in residential neighborhoods are normal. Mm -hmm. You know, bars and things within a residential neighborhood are normal. Do you think there is a, a possibility to return you know, some of the planning that existed, I guess, before the rise of the automobile in the 60s uh, to return American cities to something that's more, you know, works more for people who can mm -hmm. remain within their neighborhood. Well, you know, this is really a fascinating time because we really do have an opportunity to reimagine our entire communities. There's going to be a lot of space and land that comes available in the relatively near future with the shakeup in, in retail and in office space. Um, so I really do see us having, you know, some resource come to play here. I, of course, when I came to San Diego, one of the first communities I had exposure to was Hillcrest and the uptown uh, area. Um, and one of the things that really impressed me uh, about living there, I got to stay with a friend of mine that lived in the uptown housing uh, development uh, that's right across from the Ralph Shopping Center there, which used to be Sears. Um, it really impressed me that everything that I would need, I could access without having to hop in a car, um, for the most part. I mean, of course, there's always going to be some things that you need outside of the community, but vast majority of what I need, I could access very easily by just walking down the street. Um, you know, we have not developed our communities um, many of our communities in that way. And that's, you know, a detriment. But we have the opportunity, I think, coming up to really kind of change that. Um, and, you know, I think this actually does kind of remind me a little bit of the Quaker communities that are kind of made up that way as well. Um, you know, we, we have a lot of great ideas. And I, I you know, I'm restoring a vintage boat to operate as a as a charter operation at some point, uh, Vintage Boat Harbor Cruises. But one of the reasons that I got started in doing this is because I am fascinated by some of the older ideas that exist out there that have tremendous value and just require a little bit of reincarnation in order to be applied to our modern circumstances. Um, so when I look at some of these, you know, I, I honestly, all the answers that we need are frankly based in some of our own country's history and, and taking some of those old ideas and recasting them towards our current needs. Um, so I don't know if that uh, addresses what you were saying, but there you go. Yeah, no, no, it, it does. Yeah, no, thank you. I see uh, Mel, Mel Mackler. Hi, John. Um, I'm fascinated by uh, this uh, issue, Tim, um, and um, over the last numbers of months, uh, since Todd Gloria came into office and uh, the uh, county turned democratic, there's been a lot of discussion about increased uh, housing uh, and support issues for the homeless, both at the county level <clears throat> and at the city level. And I'm wondering how many uh, of these alternative uh, living uh, structures that you're talking about are being considered or if they're only uh, really looking at uh, very typical uh, means of, of habitation for homeless people or for low income people. Well, I don't wanna be a total curmudgeon. Um, <laughs> So I, I do want to give some credit where a little bit of credit is due. I think it was the good idea to look at some of the um, underutilized hotels as yeah. having the potential to address some of our homeless uh, needs. But I think really outside of that, it's, it's of course, you know, it was bound to be. I, I've personally been disappointed. I'm not going to say the elected official's name, but um, I had really hoped for a lot more leadership, but what you see is the sort of usual suspects mm -hmm. um, who are able to, to get into this discussion and to crowd out uh, other voices that aren't driven by 
profit. And I really feel that, that you know, like I said uh, earlier during my presentation, it really is time for a community-based movement to start pressing this because I don't think that absent that, I mean, if you look at community choice aggregation for energy, it really was the community that came up with this and, and really pressed it into the political arena and said, hey, you guys, this is what we want. Um, and then political leaders recognizing that, that the ground had shifted underneath them then began to move in, in that direction. And I think when it comes to this, it's gonna be the same thing. We have to start having these discussions. And that's one of the reasons that I wanted to talk to this group and, and, and hopefully others in the future is to start the, you know, the discussion at the community level so that we can start pressing this issue upward. Thank you. I appreciate your comments. That's good. Well, thank you. Thank you again, Tim, for uh, coming and joining us today and kicking off this conversation. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And, I know and thank you on, for having me. Yeah, no, you're very welcome. I know it's difficult when everybody's on mute or whatever to show their applause or appreciation, but you can either come off mute, mute and applaud, or you can just raise an emoji or reaction in the, in the Zoom tab. But thank you, Tim. Thank you. Oh, one last shot of the Chihuahua. <laughs> very nice. Pugilopolis, a mm. fine fellow. Good boy. He's been very patient. I'm going to, okay, so I'm going to uh, go ahead and um, take him for his evening stroll so he can do his agenda. And thank you again. And uh, we'll be talking again soon. Yep, that's great. Thank you. All right. Bye bye. Thanks. Okay, so next up then we have officer reports. And so um, I think if we want to start with uh, Kip, if you're, if you're good. Hi everybody, happy upcoming Thanksgiving. Uh, not much to report today other than to get the approval of the minutes sent out after the last meeting. Um, if anyone saw them in the email or if I could get a motion to approve, that would be great. That's good. I shall make a motion to approve. Um, I shall second. This is Diane. Thank you, John. Thank you, Diane. And then we'll send out an email with a lot of the content from today's meeting uh, very soon. That's good. Yeah, and just to check, there were no no discussions or corrections or anything. Everybody's happy. That's good. There Excellent. was a Thank correction oh, that was really? made, but the secretary acknowledged it and corrected it. So Excellent. Thank, Thank you again, Ruth. Thanks. That's great. Okay, so with that then we have Angela. Hey everyone. Um, our bank account right now has $8,500 in it. Um, we have, we made some great gifts last month thanks to the club's decision where we gave $500 to the Partnership for the Advancement of New Americans for the Afghan refugees, also to Casa Cornelia Law Center um, and then we also uh, made a gift to the Ocean Beach um, Town Council's Holiday Food and Toy Drive. Um, so we are spending the money on um, good works and we also received some very much thank yous from the organizations that we gave money to. I wanted to let every, remind everybody that um, it, 2022 is coming up. We request that you uh, renew your membership. Um, we try to have everybody renew by the end of January. If you would like to get that item checked off your box, uh, if you renew now, it will be good through the end of uh, December of 2022. So anytime you want to renew, you can. And again, the individual membership for 2022 will be $25. Uh, and you can go onto our website to make that happen. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to just ask people if there was any interest is that um, I am willing at our house to uh, accept um, toys for the Western Service Workers Association, and then I will, I'm willing to drive them down to um, their offices if it would be more convenient for anybody to have um, a drop off here in Point Loma as compared to driving 
down to the office there. Um, do you think that would be useful or do are people going to probably just go on to the target registry and have it delivered directly to them? Any thoughts about that? Sounds like an excellent idea. Okay, so I will be in discussion with Kip and when he sends out the notes from today's meeting, um, you know, maybe I'll suggest that the weekend of December 4th and 5th that people can drop them off at our house and I will have that information for Kip to include in the um, minutes from this meeting. And that's it. That's great, thanks Angela. And then Diane, do you have a report? Um, no, I, I don't have anything to report this month, thanks. Okay, no problem. I shall remove you from the spotlight then. Yeah, just say my report, just very briefly, we did send out the survey. Thank you to everybody who responded. I think we got about 40% um, of people responded, which is great for a survey. We will be mulling over those results and, you know, we'll report them back out to everybody, but also um, see how we change meetings up for next year. To say this is the last meeting of this year, the last Zoom meeting. Normally in December, we would have a physical get together for a holiday party. But I think the consensus when we asked around with everybody, with the, uh, you know, meeting strangers um, in a confined space without adequate ventilation and the rest of it wasn't a good idea until after the, after the holidays. So we won't be having a meeting in December and our next meeting will be in January. Okay. Uh, oh yeah, and the officer elections are in February. Susan just reminded me, yeah. But the January meeting will probably be getting into endorsements. Yeah, we, um, I think last meeting we did mention about endorsements. I'm coming up at the end of the year, the local Metro West area moved back their endorsements or friendly incumbent considerations until uh, January. So we have time to do that at, at our January meeting. Okay, so with that then, we'll uh, hand it over to any electeds or representatives or candidates um, who would like to talk. If you wanna raise your hand in the uh, reaction button in Zoom, Or not? I can't. I can't believe it. Yeah, there we go, Cody. You're you're running for something important. You got you got to you got to talk. Yeah, yeah one of those days. Um, uh, my name is Cody Patterson. Uh, I am um, running for San Diego Unified School District Sub District C. I am a parent in the district. I'm also a product of the district. Um, I just want to say, point out. I got my band here today. It was the grand opening of um, the Mid Coast Trolley. And uh, Sandeg had a great event. I'm um, senior advisor, supervisor, Loss Reamer, and director of intergovernmental affairs for her. Um, we're very happy about that. And one of the things I'd like to work on at Santa Unified is uh, articulating our transit and our climate action planning um, with the school district, both in terms of climate curriculum and in terms of um, electrification of the um, of the enterprise itself, the buildings and the parking lots, um, and to get us get get the schools integrated into our regional decarbonization framework. Um, also, we just saw the build back better. Uh, hopefully, it'll get uh, passed by the yeah, Senate yeah. and signed soon. It is wonderful. It's got universal pre-K as an element of it, and we've got that coming through California. So that will be a question. I would love to be part of in, uh, implementing that um, in collaboration with the federal government and state government. Um, it's really groundbreaking, real breakthrough, and community schools, um, the community schools paradigm where we really uh, have wraparound services and we acknowledge the frontline, um, the, the role that schools play in terms of providing uh, frontline social services and uh, attacking the socioeconomic determinants of education, um, reduce class size, et cetera, implementing the governor's um, local control funding formula, expansion of funding is just great news. So I would really appreciate the endorsement of this club um, and, uh, and work to honor it uh, if I were to receive it. Uh, so thank you very much, Cody Pedersen, uh, Sub-District Street, San Diego, Unif Sub-District C, San Diego Unified School District. Thanks so much. That's great, thank you, Cody. And then uh, Mandy, you're up next. Good evening, um, everyone. My name is Mandy Haplick, and I'm on the member, uh, sorry, I'm one of the board members for the Peninsula Community Planning Board. And this past meeting, I just wanted to inform you that we did have John and Tracy Vandewalker. Um, they are the neighbors, uh, they're representing uh, the issue with regards to the palms along Newport and, um, 
Santa Barbara in the Point Loma area, and we did unanimously support a letter requesting information from the city and the FAA to provide more information and transparency with regard to why they're removing these palm trees. Mm -hmm. And um, we're hoping to get some support from Scott Peters here um, this week. We've made contact with his staff and they seem interested in wanting to initiate an FAA inquiry. And so um, we'd like to find out more questions. Some of the questions that were brought up were uh, concern over the rate of growth of 2.5 feet per year that they were stating uh, was for these Washingtonian palms. Um, there's concern about the right of way and where the right of way starts and ends and who is responsible for the removal and the maintenance of these trees. And so it's really just an opportunity to get more information and to educate the community about the process. I'm offended by this woman who won't put her picture up and she's talking. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, it's fine. It's fine, Maddie. Blip, continue. I think it was somebody just oh, yeah. on mute. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you need to show my picture. You want to see my face? Hi. Hi, everyone. <laughs> okay. Hey. Um, all right. Well, and um, as well, um, we did. So we, we had that letter that got approved. And then there were three traffic letters, um, some areas of concern around the community that we are wanting to ask for more traffic safety mitigations were the entire crowd corridor along from Voltaire all the way to Sunset Cliffs Boulevard. We've made a request for some traffic calming measures there to help promote safety of um, the neighborhood along that area. And then there was also a um, request to have the city uh, review the intersection of Catalina at Hill and Santa Barbara. There, uh, it's kind of got a weird design, it's a K design. And um, there's some lines there that uh, ask the drivers to keep the area clear. And sometimes they stop at that line because they think it's like a stop sign and they'll abruptly stop and cause close misses. And then the final um, uh, re letter for traffic that we had requested was with regard to the Nimitz corridor, especially regarding where the I-8 dead ends at Nimitz, when you make that left turn coming into the peninsula, you come to a fork where it breaks off to Nimitz and then the those in the right turn lane, they break off going into Sunset Cliffs Boulevard into Ocean Beach. Well, when those two lanes make that left, there's no real demarcation or delineation of the lines and it creates some confusion with um, people making that left. And so we also requested some more demarcation of that and a review of that corridor with regard to speeds and to upgrade some bicycle facilities along that area to help promote the connection of our, our bicycle facilities throughout our, our city. And so um, I, I'm encouraged that we got uh, unanimous, close to unanimous support from the board for a majority of those letters. And so we will be standing down for the December holiday. We've been working very hard for the community this last year. And we will have our next meeting um, on the third Thursday of January, which will be January 20th at 6 p.m. We are still meeting via Zoom. And so um, you do have to pre-register for those meetings and you can find the meeting uh, registration link at our website, which is pcpb.net. And I can put that in the chat for you if you're interested. But um, I, I appreciate all the work. I really enjoyed the presentations tonight and I wish everyone a happy um, fall holiday season and um, look forward to hopefully seeing you at a PCPB meeting uh, here soon. So have a great evening, everyone. That's great, thank you, Mandy. And thank you for those updates on the traffic. I think everybody would agree all of those are, uh, yeah. are quite uh, necessary. And then next up we have uh, Gary. Hi there. Sorry, Ruth. I'm I'm having a very bad hair day, so you can't see me on camera. But um, at any rate, um, I wanted to just report on some upcoming activities for the town council, Ocean Beach Town Council, which I'm on. 
Um, the uh, holiday parade is taking place again this year. Um, and uh, it's gonna be on Saturday, December 4th, starts at 5 p.m. Um, and uh, it should be really great. Um, I, I haven't seen the current list of participants. Is the club gonna have a float this year, John? Uh, we are not, no. Not, okay. Yeah. Okay, very good. Um, yeah, so we're still accepting some entries and stuff. Um, I'm responsible for elected officials and candidates who want to enter the um, parade. The fee is $100 and you can get in touch with me if you're interested in uh, having a uh, entry in the parade on Saturday the 4th. Um, and then, uh, and also we're going to have um, a, um, a viewing area for those uh, who want to contribute um, it's $75 to be on the deck where Wonderland, the outside area at Wonderland, OB um, Surf Lodge, that area there. There'll be uh, food and drinks and a great viewing area to watch the parade. And uh, those uh, tickets are available for $75. All the money goes to towards the food and toy drive, uh, which takes place. Um, the distribution is Saturday, December 18th at 10 a.m. We do need people. If you want to help with that, please let me know. I'll put my email in the chat, um, or it's just Gary at Ocean Beach or obtowncouncil.org. Um, we need volunteers to help uh, distribute food and toys to the families that have, have um, are going to receive them. And then the week of December 13th, if you have time and want to come and help pack up toys and wrap things and that sort of thing, that will go on in the late afternoon, early evening, uh, the week of December 13th as well. And then um, the only other thing is um, the annual holiday auction and holiday party is gonna be Saturday, December 11th from six to 9 p.m. at the holding company. And I think it's like $5 to join. It's mainly just to have a good time and bring people together safely. So hope you can join us in one of those ways. Thank you so much. That's great, Gary. Thank you. Yeah, and, and again, Kip will put some of the details for that in the uh, email that goes out after the after the meeting. Thank so, you. are there any other announcements from anybody? No. Okay. Well, I think just just on time for once, five thirty is the time we can go ahead then and adjourn the meeting. And then I think, as um, as was mentioned earlier, MTS did open up the. Uh, uh, the Blue Line trolley line now runs all the way from the border all the way up to UCSD, um, which is kind of exciting. And so with that, we will close out with some appropriate... Oh, I see Ruth's hand is up. Yeah, sorry, Ruth. Do you want to go ahead? Uh, you're on mute, Ruth. I go. just wanted to wish everybody a happy holiday season. Since I won't be able to see you this year in person, but just remember, I will be thinking about you uh, and wishing you all a Merry Christmas and a Thank good you. Thanksgiving before then. Yes, I was going to say, we get the order correct. Yes, yes, we yeah. hope everybody has a very safe uh, and uh, happy holiday this week. And then obviously uh, celebrations over the winter, which is good. Yes. And, with and that, if they're looking at me, they'll see that my tree is already up thanks to my granddaughter. Ho, ho, ho. There's Who visited no. me this weekend. <laughs> That's great. Excellent. Thank you, Ruth. Mm -hmm. That's good. And thank you, everybody, for joining today. And uh, with that, we'll close out with some music. But we'll try to close out. You know what John's like with his music. He'll hit play on the machine and see if it plays.
Very good. Thank you, Ruth. That was good. And for anybody who didn't recognize that, of course, that was Thomas the Tank Engine. And uh, with that, have a good night.